Thank you so much for tuning in to She's All Over the Place with Kitty Aki. That's me. Welcome to She's All Over the Place. So excited to have you here. We're here to add value to your life, to inspire you, to take actionable steps for your ultimate success and health. I have an amazing scientist on with me today. His name is Dr. John Jankwish, and he is amazing. He is the first scientist and doctor I've had on the podcast, and I thought it was so apropos and important because, you know, as human beings with our ambition and everything that we want to do in life, um, there's multiple parts, and one of the parts is the psychological part and doing it with health, but doing actionable steps with smart choices. So uh, Dr. John Jankwish is here. And with no further ado, thank you, John, so much for joining me today. Hey, Katie, thanks so much for having me. Yes, definitely. So uh, nuts and bolts, where are you in the world right now? Um, Near Lake Tahoe. Very cool. Very cool. Some stuff up here. And uh, as you know, my product is uh, Made in America. Now the bands, the latex, you can't grow tree latex in in America very well. So the bands have to come from Sri Lanka. Oh, okay. Everything else is not only, and usually made in America means made in America, assembled in America with Chinese parts. No, the parts are made in America. And then it is assembled in America, boxed in America, and then mm-hmm. shipped wherever in the world it needs to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Keep everything to such a high quality standard. And then why did you decide to care, um, to create the X3 bar? Well, so it has to do with uh, the medical device I invented. That was my first invention. And that, that triggers bone growth. But um, when I was looking at the data that I pulled off the first trial that was done in London, I noticed that people were using deconditioned postmenopausal women were using seven, eight, nine times their body weight when they would load the hip joint or the knee joint or uh, maybe like it was, it was just a huge departure from where we, we would see the loading uh, in, a, in a typical fitness environment. So I compared the data from the study that was done on my first invention. I didn't do that study. I just participated from a methods perspective, mm-hmm. conflict of interest. So I basically just wrote the instructions like, Hey, you know, this is the way to use it in any, any way that is not this way is wrong. Um, because sometimes people just decide to invent their own way of doing things. And you know, that's how soldiers shoot allies. So, uh, we want to keep that from happening. Yeah. So, um, so what what I wanted to do is look take this study and really look at the comparison between that and then what we had in like the NAINS database, uh, which is something uh, the National Institute of Health in the United States maintains. There's 20,000 people in that survey, and they add about 1,000 or 2,000 a year uh, to go into that survey data. So they ask them the same questions they've been asked for, for the last 10 years. And when was that? It's ongoing. When you first um, participated in the studies, which year was that around? Well, when I first... When the when the first publication came out on my invention, uh, that was 2015. 2015. Yeah. And the device had existed before, but without the clinical data, it should have really had. But, you know, it worked for everybody. And people saw their own bone density going up. So that was enough for them. Uh, but, yeah, it was something we needed from a cred- credibility standpoint. When I took that data and when I looked at that, it was uh, very compelling because because I compared the NAIDS database to the data that came off the, the study about, about uh, it's called OsteoStrong, the technology. And people were dealing with seven times the amount of force than they normally would in a weightlifting environment. So like somebody, some deconditioned elderly person is compressing bone at seven times their body weight voluntarily like strongest guy in the world doesn't lift seven times his body weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What really had to do with the specific positioning I took uh, with regards to the biomechanics of the body and force delivery into the body. And so, and what I was trying to do is emulate the impacts of gymnastics. So gymnasts have the highest bone density in the world. They're the outliers. And it's because of the way they contact the ground. They hit the ground at incredible velocity. And then they get sometimes 10 times their body weight. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Now, they are often injured. They're very young, and the average age of retirement for a gymnast is 19. Wow. And it's that one for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Like they, yeah. it, it's, a hard, it's a hard on your body kind of sport. And there's, you only have to land wrong once, and you can have a career ending injury. Mm-hmm. So, but no matter that, what I want to do is create a set of devices that would give us the benefit of high impact without the risks of high impact. So, that's what the device was. It drove that information. Once I had that information, I looked at the huge difference, a sevenfold difference between what people actually work out with and what their capability is. So if we, if you know when you're lifting weights, you're really using one seventh of what you could use, mm-hmm. one seventh of your muscle tissue, one seventh of your actual potential, wouldn't then weightlifting be a waste of time? Or said a different way, we're not seeing the kind of results out of weightlifting for a reason because it's very inefficient. And, and that, that is why I wrote, my, when I wrote my book, it's called Weightlifting is a Waste of Time uh, because I can prove that. Is and it available on audio as well for people? It who is are- available on audio. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Right? And it's oh. largely about the journey that that I first had and then, and then I... Uh, brought on my, my co-author and, and he's a biomedical engineer also. He's been working on a lot of these things with me. And so when when X3, when I first had the concept of X3 and he, he was the first person I showed it to and uh, like, well, like it can't really be this simple because it was simple design. And the answer is, yeah, it really is that simple. Yeah, I've seen the bar. I've seen the different, the thick band, yeah. the medium band, the the small bands. I've seen the right. different bands. Yeah, and yeah, it just seems very simple. You can literally like pack it, take it with you wherever you go on a weekend trip. It's just, it's super simple to take with you. I was you. just in Vegas. I had it with me, but I take it. I, I have some great pictures uh, from my balcony at the King George Hotel in Athens. Oh my God. Oh my God. Which we love. We love the hotel. And right. oh my God, having breakfast at the buffet with, and then yeah, seeing yeah. You with the Parthenon. Uh. No. Yeah. The part you can see the Parthenon behind me. I actually, I went to that restaurant and I started working out like next to my table. And of course I had like a film crew with me because they loved the area and the restaurant was like, what are you doing? Oh, I mean, they have those, all those amazing paintings, the whole, it's so Wait, But I got there like 7 a.m. Nobody was up there. And I'm just yeah. like, let me do this. And so oh, they're like, yeah. besides, you know, I know the owners of the hotel, so it wasn't like that big of a deal. But I got some great pictures there. Oh, I, t- I did a whole photo shoot up there. Also in the lobby, they have the most amazing artwork by these amazing artists, the, the artwork, everything, the lobby, yeah. so gorgeous. And then did you go next door to the restaurant next door and have dinner on the rooftop there too? There's a hotel next door. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, that Same owner. I forgot the name of it. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Or like one day we're going to like be there together talking and just like, That'd be great. you time. know, there's, there used to be a secret tunnel between there and parliament. Yes. Yes. And that's how Winston Churchill would get to parliament every day. Cool. Very yeah. cool. So I used his office while I was there. Really? Yeah. Nice. I'm a big Churchill fan. Yeah, he was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever had. That was cool. I don't know if you know it off the top of your mind, but do you have any favorite like quotes or uh, words of wisdom from Churchill that you kind of are about your mantras that you live by? They would all be very controversial. Actually, no, I take it back. There is one. You will never get to where you're going if you stop on the road to throw rocks at every barking dog. Oh, yes. Yeah. You just ignore ignore the haters. Honestly, they're just stupid animals, like yeah. barking dogs. Just like dogs focused. don't bark because they're smart, you know? <laughs> like they, yeah, so, right. So just, just keep going. Yeah, I love don't that. Pay any attention to your detractors, because guess what? They didn't invent anything. Right, yeah, right. yeah. Just right. it's, It just takes you off your path of your goal and where you're going. Just, yeah. just not ignore the distractions just you mm-hmm. you acknowledge it they're there but then you just keep on going right because right. yeah very cool very cool and then um uh, tony robbins is your partner with the x3 bar so tell us about osteo strong he's not partner in the oh X3. with the osteo strong okay i'm not perfect don't 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 hate me but, no it's um, okay he wanted to be ah. uh, but i was like no i got this one myself yeah. Well, I watched the, I watched the video of him talking about Austria strong. So, uh, do you want to kind of pivot and talk about that? And I mean, I, for, how'd you meet Tony Robbins? How did he become your partner? Like, um, like he how did you, me. I got a great answer to that. Oh, he, he called he, you a, like a random phone call from Tony Robbins. So he loved everything, your energy, your, what you were about. 
and he called you and and said hey like i want you to be my new best friend let's go into business together like what happened yeah Yeah, he didn't use those words uh he said, I, I, I want one of your, one of your machines. And I'm like, huh? well, I only have prototypes and they're like $300,000 a piece. And he goes, I'll pay 300,000. And I'm like, who is this? You know, he, he says, this is Tony Robbins. Mm. And I knew I recognized the voice from somewhere. And cause yeah, he has a very distinct voice. And so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> now I, now I know you're serious. So yeah. So we made him one, we made him another, another Osseous wrong device. And I delivered it to his house and, uh, you know, we hung out for a long time and yeah, we did have a lot in common. Yeah. Uh, a lot yeah. of the things he recommends, like I, well, I had never been to one of his events or anything like that. I think I had heard a tape somewhere like tape, mm-hmm. you know, maybe yeah. like undergrad, like it was like in my fraternity house or something like that. And I listened to it and I was like, no, mm-hmm. In 2005, I was introduced to the name iconic Tony Robbins. I was in an acting class with Michael Wilson. And they're like, if you want to have a life changing experience, go to Tony Robbins. Everyone was saying it. And I was just like, I'm not into that woo woo stuff, whatever. I'm not going to go see a life coach. It changed my life. Blah, 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 blah. And life journeys went on. You kept hearing about Tony Robbins, but someone gifted me. Um, and I have it. I have it. And I, I just listened to it not even long ago. And uh, oh my God, he talks about the blueprint and how you have the like your little girl blueprint and then and going back and rewriting your blueprint. So I'm a big fan yeah. of that. I have that on an audio. And then I saw his Netflix special um, on Netflix. Yeah, right. um, I've never partaked. And and then through the years, I definitely wanted to, but it was like, I don't know, like $10,000 or something like that. I'm like, holy camoles. Ten thousand yeah. dollars, like <laughs> so. But the, yeah, I mean, obviously he's legendary, and you're legendary, and he contacted you to be a part of what you're doing, and that's the biggest honor and compliment. So I'd be so proud of yourself for it's being cool. you and taking the actionable steps that you are to help people, to empower people, and and to be that leader. And it's just such a beautiful thing to hear and witness. So congratulations, that's so awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, that's that, but that's how it started with Tony. He just called me and yeah, uh, yeah it's been going well ever since. I'm being transparent here, but um, I'm probably going to botch it. <laughs> um, my mom's doctor just told her two days ago that she has um, osteopenia, osteopenia. Osteopenia. Yes, she has that. So that's on the verge of um, where she's headed. So uh, what are actionable steps that she can do um, in her life and for other women and, and men out there who uh, maybe need to be more mindful and aware of what they can do for, you know, their, their bone health and their, their, right. their ultimate lifestyle. Yeah. Ultimately she needs to get to an osteostrong. You know, people want, people are like, well, what can you do at home? And I'm like, well, if you could do something at home, I wouldn't have invented the thing, you know? So uh, yeah, osteostrong. Okay. Uh, it's a medical device that puts axial compression. So this is the axis of a bone and you compress the bone from end to end. And uh, that's what triggers growth. Yeah. Okay. You need to compress it to a fatigue point. But okay. that the, the computer software at OsteoStrong does that all for you. It's very straightforward. Got it. So that's the golden ticket. That's just like hands down what to do. Where does your mother live? Michigan. Okay. That's a large place. More specific? Oh, Where? um, 30 minutes outside of Detroit by Ann Arbor. Oh, sh- yeah. There's uh, there's definitely one near her. I can't think of the exact city. Wow. Yeah. So where is Austria strong then? And like how many countries? Greece, yeah. Yeah. i uh, got a huge presence in Greece. The um, Well, we're in eight different countries. Okay. Uh, 150 clinics. Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. And then, and then people just get on a program and they have to go X amount of times or like, is it a continual thing or maybe you want, it, you want them to go and then you want them to keep testing their bone density. Um, I'd tell them to, to do the, the blood work because it's so much more accurate than the blood work. Yeah. The industry standard is to do a DEXA scan, a dual x-ray absorbiometry test. The problem is that really looks at out the outside of the bone. It really doesn't do a very good job at looking at the inside of the bone. And you know, let's let's look at the whole thing. So what what's in the blood test shows the activity from an anabolic perspective and a catabolic perspective of what's happening in the bone density, which is way more important. Um, but you should have a DEXA scan also at some point. 
But the uh, what we want to do is first get it trending upward. We need a more anabolic than catabolic ratio. And then do you do that at your normal doctor or do they do it at Osteo Strong? They do all the tests there. A blood, well. lab, a blood lab would have the, oh. the BAP, P1NP or CTX uh, blood tests. Got it. Mm. Wow, this is so impactful and informative. And it's so great to know about it, um, you know, for our loved ones. And it's so good to know about it, you know, while we're young, vibrant and youthful so we can take actionable steps to protect ourselves and for the youngsters out there listening and and watching um what are some preventative measures to not go down that road to to limit right now i had a i had a conversation a couple years ago with some uh some of the guys that are in charge of west point and they were telling me that there are 18 year old males coming into west point these guys are the best right like they don't what is west point it's the official college of the U.S. Army. Okay, got it. It's like Annapolis is for the Navy. So that's the, you know, it's the academy. Yes. So you go to college, but you also get a military education. Um, so West Point is a very elite school, very hard to get into. Physical fitness tests are hard, or at least they were. Uh, they're still hard for the people who are trying to pass the test because every kid is kind of a weakling now. And that's that's the problem is these these 18 year old males who should have sky high bone density actually have low bone density. And they're not quite osteopenic yet, but they're 18. Yeah. It's going down when you exceed 30. So they're going to have a, a lower peak bone mass, which is terrible. So for the musicians out there and artists out there who maybe aren't so active, but they don't want to go so macho into the extreme, what's a, what's a good regimen maybe per week to be able to, you know, get the optimal health in and exercise in, um, in your perspective? Well, I find actually through the X3 experience, which is a very, very different way of exercise. So that's, that's my exercise product, not my medical advice. I find that people are not lazy at all. People are stupid but they're not lazy. Like, and by stupid, I really mean unwilling to learn, you know, like you ever have a political conversation with somebody who you like hit them with like 10 actual, like real things. And they're like, well, all that's lies. Like they just, you know, <laughs> they want to dismiss reality. And you're like, okay, so I'm certainly not changing your mind. Get on planet earth. Let's just like talk or about, about the facts people here. Think they have all the answers like the weightlifters. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Like, I get death threats on a regular basis, but yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Because because weightlifting is your religion. What's wrong with you? But it's it's what they were taught. It's there. It's limited. It's a perspective, and it's limited. And and it may all they have. The ones that really kick and scream about it. Maybe the only thing they have in life is I lift dangerous weights, so therefore I'm cool. Because if you see like CrossFit videos where people are throwing their weights against the ground and make a loud noise, like that's a serious mental illness there. Yeah, like, that's that violent. Is it is movement. violent. It's completely yeah. it's it's like, violent it, for for others and for themselves. If they're if they're doing that on an external level, imagine what they're doing to themselves. Oh, like, yeah. However, you are to your worst enemy, and me too. However, we are to our worst enemy. We're ten times, sixty nine times harder on ourselves. You know, so. Mm-hmm. It's really sad. It's really sad. Um, the like you said, the education of people not being educated, and and they with they on a circumstantial level, they were taught certain things, and so it's kind of I want to say breaking the generational trauma, but breaking the generational mind for about about uh, physical impact and how we should be fit as human beings, like right. to dismantle all this crap, and that's why you have the book. Let's wind it back and. Sure. and- Answer your question. So, because I think, yeah, ultimately, the reason I said people are not afraid of hard exercise, it's just the time. Even young people, like, they, there's a lot of stuff they'd rather do. But if they can get a workout done in 10 minutes, now the X3 makes it a very hard workout. Like, it's the hardest workout of your life, but it's over real quick. And people don't mind that. Most consumer products have a 30% return rate. With fitness, it's a little higher because people are lazy and they don't, you know, they don't want to do it or they get no results out of it. So 30% of the product of fitness companies at least comes right back to them. We have a 1% return rate. Really? And, and, and it's usually the reason is they only unwrap the lightest band and they can't do the lightest one. Mm-hmm. But then they're just like, I, I don't like it. Well, I know why you didn't like it. You realize it was hard work and you wanted nothing to do with that. Yeah. But I see that is really like a 1% problem. 
The rest of the people use it and they immediately see results. If you use it correctly the first time, you will see results in a couple of days. In uh-huh. the mirror. If you're a lean person, if you're not a lean person, you won't see it until you start dropping some body fat and you can see some, some definition in muscle. But, you know, I mean, like I'm a lean guy and I can see different things going on in my arms and wow. you know, in my arms, different, you know, separation of different things. So I was able to see those things. Okay, wait, I don't know how many- yours, yours looks amazing, but how, how, do, how do mine look? Tell me the truth. What's going on here? What do you think? It, well, it needs some work. <laughs> you're, you're being honest. Yeah. You, if you, if you wanted to be a more defined person i mean have more muscular definition yeah yeah a lot of things you do yeah and by a lot i mean you know the way i do it because that's a fit i wouldn't want to do it the way other people are trying to do it because whatever percentage here's another thing about the fitness industry i I, so many people defending the traditional way of doing it i'm i tell them like this is fitness is the most failed human endeavor the most like if you look and i have data uh, there's studies on this about how unfit people who engage in fitness really are but like the lowest percentage of body fat the lowest one percentile is 10.9 percent for males that's pathetic 10.9 percent isn't even lean that's not even visible abdominals that's like maybe you can see a little bit of the top of your abdominals but you're basically chubby mm-hmm. at, at yeah. 12 or yeah. less somebody yeah i mean you're, you're nothing special at all and this is the top one percent so who is really fit who really has and this is part of what i want to point out to women too and women have been dealing with this for a long time whereas like what is presented to you is unrealistic okay maybe it is maybe it isn't that's debatable but how many women get modeling contracts very few how many women want them millions Mm -hmm. how many men let's talk about men because when you talk about muscle it's more associated with masculinity how many look like professional athletes there's even professional athletes that don't look like professional athletes i gotta add that in but very true especially those football players some of them just are like yeah well some of them are amazing you know you you wouldn't say that about a typical wide receiver but maybe you know a defensive end yeah he has no motivation to be lighter Mm -hmm. so two extra large pizzas for that guy yeah 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 yeah. that's how they do it uh but they're also strong but my point is Who's really fit? One in six males have used or are currently using anabolic steroids in in America over the age of over the age of eighteen. Dangerous chemicals. That's one so, in- wait, one, that's so scary. And two, that's um really bad for your bone density, right? The steroids depends on which drug. Yes, some some no, but um it's bad for. A lot of things, liver health, kidney health, um, cardiac health. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of reasons why you really want to avoid anabolic drugs with the exception of testosterone replacement therapy, because that's just replacing what should be there. So you might have a deficit because of all this chemical crap that they put in processed foods uh, or, or like in a lot of vegetables, uh, diminished testosterone. So like people going towards plant-based, like they, they're really hurting their testosterone, but you can get testosterone replacement therapy, which mm-hmm. is fine. But that puts you back at a normal level. That's not like you get, you know, the same thing that the bodybuilder gets. No, you don't. So you, you should be normal when you, when you have that. But so, but the, this is not what the survey was about. It was one in six are using anabolic steroids, meaning high doses. So who's fit? Is it one in six people? Well, we already know the top percentile isn't even there. So it's not one in six, it's maybe one in 600, probably more like one in 60,000. Cause look, like you can, you can count all the males on Instagram that are in really good shape. Maybe there's 40 of them or 50 of them in the world. So why is it that their method of doing it, if they're the only ones that have that is effective? Maybe there's something unique about them which is the last chapter of my book, the big genetic difference between the guy who guy or girl who gets really strong and doesn't mm-hmm. has to do with a tendon alteration. All the rest of us have like our pectorals insert on the middle of your chest. So like, like dead center, right, right on your sternum. And then the insertion point of the te- pectorals on the other end 
is typically right where the bicep starts on the humerus bone. So you bring the humerus bone across the body and toward the body. And that's what that muscle does as it shortens, as it contracts. But some people, and these people are much more likely to become professional athletes, have a longer lever arm in their arm. So a lever arm and an arm are two different things. I'm talking mm-hmm. about geometry in, in one perspective and an actual physical human arm in another perspective. Great. Don't get Great. them confused. So instead of that insertion right under here, yeah. right under, right at the beginning of the bicep, they have the insertion at the other end of the bone. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and Mike, Mike Tyson has this, which is why he can punch someone who's four inches from his face and knock him out. So those people have a, a genetic anomaly going on with their tendon insert, insertion points. And it's usually universal all over the body where they, they're more advantageous So they have a stronger, weaker range and they can contract more musculature in just about everything they do. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with drugs. It has to do with leverage. It has to do with their body giving them a strategic advantage in gaining muscle because they can load the weaker ranges and they're able to activate more muscle in those weaker ranges, which keeps them from damaging joints. So they get to keep doing this and doing this and doing this until they become very well-developed people. My product throws that equation away. X3 throws that out. Everybody has the advantage now with variable resistance. So that's like the biggest genetic difference. And it's, so I tell, tell people who say, oh, you know, all those guys on Instagram, they're in shape, they're all on steroids. That's always said by somebody who has like baby arms and a double chin. Somebody who's never tried anything. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I see you've done a thorough analysis here. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I say like one in six people are, are taking steroids. No, I was just, who's in shape? Maybe one in 60,000. So you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, that I was thinking about with the X3 bar is because it's so sustainable that it's actually, you're doing great things for the environment. I mean, there's all these pieces of plastic machine bikes and junk. It's like, you don't, it just takes up so much space in the world. And to make all this plastic crap, like you're doing great for the environment by having something that's so sustainable. And it's like heirloom quality. You'll like be able to hand it down to your kids. It's so powerful. It's, it's great quality. Like, it's and not going to like dissolve in five years. I thought that was really important because, you know, with being mindful of sustainability in our environment, commend you because I think it's, I'm very big into um, environmental health. And, and my parents downstairs in the basement, they have all these machines and And they just got my dad a new one two months ago, you know, so he'll start working out again. He's been on it twice. And it's just like this big clunker thing that like he, he doesn't need. So, you know, everyone definitely check out the X3 bar. Um, You know, uh, Tom Brady has been using the X3 in many different ad videos, including his own ads. Um, So I was wondering if you could talk about Tom Brady. I definitely cannot. I do not pay Tom Brady. Um, So I cannot confirm or deny whether he uses it or not. But um, there's a lot of pro athletes that use okay. it. Um, there's, you know, like a, there's a guy on the Lakers. It's like one of the best guys in the in the NBA. And I, I, I reach out to these guys and I talk to Tom Brady's uh, staff. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, the, see if we could work something out. We could not. Um, but I know he likes it. Yeah. Great. Or awesome. Lingo. I mean, if yeah. Tom Brady's a big fan, then I mean, and if he uses it. Well, he's very public about his his liking of variable resistance. So he understands that the human body is a lot stronger at, you know, an extension of a movement versus, you know, the, the back position Uh Uh, and him and his trainer, Alex Guerrero, uh, they, they definitely are, are both, seeing that and they're a more efficient way to train is something that, that they were after. So uh, it's all right. We're, we're fans of each other. Cool. Very, yeah. very cool. Very cool. Pivoting. Can you tell us um, the audience a little bit about the paper you were authored with NASA? Yeah, uh, that came out last week. So there were two people from NASA that work, worked with me on uh, on a paper. Now I participated uh, like with the other paper from the methods perspective but we got something done in this paper that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read you. Uh, okay. Important part of this of this paper. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. So remember, what I was talking about blood tests. Blood tests are superior to the uh, DEXA scan because DEXA is really just a picture. Like an X-ray is a picture. This tells you what's happening, so it's a more dynamic test. Like 
if you know what your anabolic level is and what your catabolic level is. And so, so just listen to this. Okay. The BAP, which is the bone formation marker, increased by 39%. And the NTX, which is the breakdown marker, uh, decreased. So we got an uh, increase of 39% and a 41% decre- decrease of the breakdown. So it's huge changes. And this was only after a couple of weeks with using the bone density technology. And then there's a, there's a quote, if the exercise apparatus could be condensed to the size of a shoebox to meet weight and volume restrictions imposed by NASA, it could potentially serve as a countermeasure for bone and strength loss on space exploration vehicles. So that sounds very positive. Yeah, of course it is. It's about as positive as you can get in a research study. Yeah. I mean, research study is not a promotion. So yeah, you know, that was, that was a, a really, a really generous comment, but when they look at the results, all they care about is the results. Mm-hmm. Like, is this going to keep? And so, like, um, I've, I've spoken on a panel with some astronauts uh, about a couple of years before before we started. No, about a year before we started this this paper. Um, speaking about how do we get astronauts to Mars? Our two biggest challenges. One is radiation. Like, what? humans really aren't meant to be in space. Like, there's radiation everywhere. Like, our atmosphere does us huge favors. Like, the idea, like the whole Star Trek thing, where we're going to like you know, like a bunch of groovy hippies and matching turtlenecks are going to travel to some other planet and just shake hands and make friends with aliens. And there's no diseases and there's no challenges and there's, there's no like a million things that can kill us. Like that's just fantasy. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's fantasy. It's totally fantasy. Leave the earth. Yep. When it blows up because of something humans didn't do. It's about it. We're not going to colonize another planet. Never going to happen. Anyway. Can we put some people on Mars, have them walk around, take a picture? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Um, and would it be interesting? Absolutely. We would probably learn all sorts of things we're not even expecting to learn. Mm-hmm. So the challenge of getting humans to Mars has to do with the radiation and bone density loss. Those are two biggest challenges when it comes to keeping you know, the astronauts alive. Like we could fuel it. We could have a launch and landing vehicle. We already have the technology to do that. We we put a roving vehicle there. So we know we can get there and like, you know, drop something off. Now all we gotta do is have the ability to pick something up and then come back, which is, you know, we're more than halfway there because we know how to do it. But you can't have dead astronauts. They gotta live and be healthy when they when they come back. So we can fix the radiation problem by levels of shielding by probably building something in space because we got to take it up in pieces because it's just too heavy because weight really matters when it comes to having the energy to escape the atmosphere when it comes to bone density we need bone compression Mm -hmm. uh and that that's what i've been working on for so many years and that's why this paper was so important because it's pretty simple approach now while the osteostrong devices weigh thousands of pounds uh, and they're not the size of a shoebox. Uh, it's okay. Like, I mean, we can do that today. Well, uh, congratulations. That's really cool that NASA selected your analysis and your report. Um, that's revolutionary. So congratulations. It's yeah. really epic. And, and, the, and the authors, are they're, they're thrilled. They, they really want to promote it to their peers. And of course, their peers are like, you know, other people on NASA or SpaceX. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a lot of people going back and forth frequently um, from SpaceX to NASA. So they have a great relationship. Do you know, by chance, Canoel sued? Mm-hmm. Oh, he's on the board at the UN and he does things for the environment all the time. And he has event events at the UN and he always has astronauts come, but he's so prolific and amazing. I actually want to introduce you to, because I know you can be a speaker and be a part of the community of like-minded astronauts who are involved in science and really doing mm-hmm. unstoppable things in the world. So I would like to include you and, in, and, in, and, in, you know, into that, into that, I'm going to, I'm going to make an introduction if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Sounds very interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to share on the NASA front with us? I just say there's more to come. Like this is a, a powerful discovery, and now they know. I think now they know that they can solve the problem in a very simple and elegant way. And you mentioned using less materials to do more. What? Well, yeah. I, I mean, ultimately, like we should always be looking at that. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Remember how big computers used to be, but really this is all we need. I mean, this is a computer. Yeah. So I, I know people that work from their phone. Especially if yeah. you're in Hawaii on the beach. <laughs> oh. 
or in, uh, in, in Greece on the islands, hopping around. Oh, no, I have, seriously, I have this um, dope video. I'm, like, on this massive ship going from one island to the another. And I'm, like, on my phone working, and my friend took a, a video of me, like, working from the sea, you know, because that's how we spend our summers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Working from the G and C. Yeah. So I know if anyone wants to geek out, I, I, um, I, I assume, I don't want to assume, but um, is the analysis report uh, just public domain if someone would want to l- read uh, your work? Yeah, you can, you can read the abstract. In fact, if you, you just get on my Instagram page and it's like the last highlight in, in press. Yeah, yeah. I saw I saw the recent post. So uh, cool. Impressive. Or, yeah. So you can get the APA reference there, but copy and pasting text out of Instagram doesn't really work. It's horrible. Because they don't want you leaving the, the environment. Are you on Clubhouse? I have an account on Clubhouse. I haven't turned it on yet, though. Oh, my God. You would boss in Clubhouse. Oh, it's such a great tool. You'll convert so many clients and so many um, new viewerships and, mm. and fans. Oh, my God. We totally need to boss and do a room in there together. Seriously. Yeah. And to, like, honor you, like, on the podcast and, and everything that just happened with NASA and just honoring you as a scientist. I mean, I would love to um, host you in a room on Clubhouse. That would be yeah. really amazing. Oh, my God. Kanul, he's a boss on Clubhouse. And uh, he actually has ex fellows. Thousands of people are a part of the the club, and uh, we'll curate it with him, and um, we'll have you on. Oh my God, people will love you in that space. All right. Yeah, we got to do it. I'm gonna make that happen. I'm a producer. Just if, just so you know. Okay. So I'm wondering about. I want to kind of pivot and turn um, onto um, the myths and benefits of fasting. Mm. Heads up, I've intermittent fasted twice. Once when I got back from uh, the King George because I was there and the beautiful woman, I was wearing a baby doll dress and uh, because it was a baby doll dress, she asked how far along I was. And yeah, so right when I came back, I did intermittent fasting and in Mm. 35 days lost 12 pounds. Got it. Yeah. So, and then I, I only did it one other time at the beginning of the pandemic. And then I heard the creator of the zero app who created zero app for intermittent fasting. He said, actually, because of the pandemic and when you're intermittent fasting, your, um, your immune system goes just full, be- just about below the breaking point. And he said, because of the pandemic, it's a, supposed to, you're supposed to keep your immune system high. So he suggested for people not to be doing the intermittent fasting. And he said he wasn't doing the intermittent fasting. Um, and that was, so I've only done it twice. That doesn't make any sense. No, maybe, maybe I took the information wrong. No, 72, uh, 72 hour fast, you completely refresh every cell in your immune system. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, but doesn't your, he, do. he was saying something because like you're supposed to, well, during the pandemic, you're supposed to keep the immune system up, not down. And he was saying something on there. Well, about while you're your, doing the fast. Yeah. I can suppress your immune system, but that, it, that your immune system will go down and, um, and it's it's best to keep it up because of the pandemic of keeping your immune system up. So I stopped doing it. I was 23 well, days in and then I stopped. Okay. okay. You did a 23 day fast? Yeah, I was going for like 40. Whoa. Yeah, it was amazing. I just had like a smoothie every day, plant-based smoothie. Okay, so got it. I went 18 hours, nothing, just right. water. Right. So that's what I do uh, every day. I eat one meal a day. So You do? Yeah. I like it. I yeah. like it. When do yeah. you normally eat? End of the day dinner okay Before earlier dinner because i don't like going to sleep with a lot of food in my stomach yeah, yeah. so circling back to the uh question um what are the myths about uh fasting oh that it'll kill you that um you need eight glasses of water a day there's zero science behind that that's just some shit somebody made up yeah like a lot of things uh that we said you know like breakfast is the most important meal of the day so you shouldn't fast that was written by Kellogg's to sell cereal. The sugar company. Yeah, the sugar company, right. The processed so, sugar company. <laughs> processed sugar. So, Raisin yeah. Bran, they just got sued not too long ago. Yeah. There's, fasting has been used in all sorts of religions just for mental clarity. And uh, I never really went down that path. The re- I mean, the religious references, because it's like we have scientific references. And I still don't, but um, I, I like um, how they do it in Ramadan. So for the, the Ramadan fasting is a more aggressive form of fasting. It's no food and no water. So you dehydrate. And when you dehydrate, your body finds its hydration. You don't stay dehydrated. You rehydrate by yourself by pulling moisture out of fat cells, which destroys them. And then you go into a very rapid autophagy, 
the, the Ramadan type fasting gives us a much more permanent type of fat loss. And so I'm trying now we talked before uh, you started recording the show. Uh, we we're just chatting about all kinds of fun stuff, but like the difference between motivation and discipline, a disciplined person is only going to care about that day or that meal or what's right in front of them. It's split second decision-making, like you're playing a video game. When you're playing a video game, it's not like, well, how is this going to affect me next week? It's like, you know, I got to beat the bad guy. So do I run and grab the bulletproof vest or do I grab the ammunition because I'm such a good shot? He's not even going to hit me. We got to be able to, you know, make that decision, but you don't struggle over it. You just make it because you have to. It's our our primal instincts, the fight and flight um, part of our brain, the reptile part of our brain. Right, right. And so binary decision making is really easy. But see, people look to motivation and they get very turned off because they realize there's a million steps to where they want to go. And it's like, okay, if I put that off one day, it's no big deal. Yeah, but you'll never get there. Never. So that's just how that's how losers think. Like, don't think like that. Think like a champion would think, which is just what's in front of me today. Do I want to go to bed and say I was a loser today? which probably means I'm going to be a loser forever. Or do you want to say I did it right and I'm one step closer. So it's pretty easy decision to make when you frame it like that. And then, so, you know, am I, am I going to break my fast and eat a, you know, somebody made a chocolate cake. Am I, am I going to eat a piece of that? No, I'm good. You know, if they push me, I'll be like, do I look like I eat chocolate cake? Like I'll get a little mean about it. I love you. Oh my God. Yeah. Cause there's, cause they're like, putting applying their stuff on you it's like get off me did you right. heard me the first time like well, what they're doing is fit shaming what is it fit, fit shaming fit shaming oh yeah. i first time i heard that word fit almost like shaming. making fun of you for like being fit but yeah, i'm people cool. do I'm that being extraordinarily in shape because i am so they can all you know get lost uh, okay yeah because like some people just recently will say oh what do you want i'm like oh because uh, just between us here i guess <laughs> and the watcher and um the viewer and the listener hi we love you thanks for being here something happened last week i won't get into the details but it hit hard like three different people it hit hard and i just i just needed to psychologically physically detox and i did a fast and i didn't say anything about it i just did I did. Uh, I've done it before, but I did. And um, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do an emotional fast. I'm just like, I'm like took action to do an emotional fast, a physical fast. I did a fast. I didn't eat anything. And a couple of people were like, oh, like, do you want anything? I'm like, no, I'm good. Thanks. Oh, you're not going to eat anything. And I want to be like, no. I'm right, it's I'm like they're, they're like ridiculing you for like not wanting to eat anything. And it's just like, hey, when you step on the scale, are you happy? And then just wait for the horrified look and say, yeah, I didn't think so. So... Can yeah. I say that? Oh my God. That really turns I say that all around. The time. I need the, I need more of that. Well, you know, like the one of the most powerful things that we do with each other is we peer pressure each other. Now, peer pressure is always used in a negative context. The after school special, it's like, come on, you want to smoke the dope just like the rest of us. That way we'll think you're cool. You know, I mean, like nobody ever talks like that except on that those after school specials. Right. Oh, right. And so but like, hold your friends to a higher standard. Like I tell my friends are overweight all the time. I love I'll, you. I'll, oh my I'll God. I love friends. that. I love that. Yeah, I, but if somebody doesn't want to hang out with me because I'm like, Hey man, you gotta get control. I'm like, come on. Um, yeah. So I love that. I love that. And people, people need more of that. You need yeah, to be able to actually be truthful be and show up for people and say it and not think your feelings are going to get hurt because you're like, Hey, like I'm saying this because I want you to stick around for another three to four years. I actually care for you. <laughs> right. you need, it, oh, that was my next thing I was going to say. You need to say it in a compassionate way, but yeah. just be real about it. It's like, and I said to a friend of mine who was extraordinarily overweight and you know, I, I go, look, you know, his, his son's like seven. And I'm like, you looking forward to his high school graduation? And he says, yeah. And I said, you sure you're going to be around for it? <gasps> oh yeah. Uh, and I'm the guy was just like, dude, like that's a little hard on me. Don't you think? And I'm like, no, man, you need to take it seriously. Like you're like 200 pounds overweight and I don't want to bury you. So let's get this fixed. And also like, I also know that people who are like morbidly obese, they're eating to medicate something. They worry. Yeah. It's, it's anxiety that forces them to eat. Right. Emotional I mean, eating. You know, you get that, you get that big and it didn't happen by accident. They're aware. Mm-hmm. 
I know. But they're also addicted based on something they're they're replacing, you know, or like an anxiety that to distract them from the anxiety, they just go. Yeah. Or there's or there's like psychological, mental abuse from your circumstances and you bury yourself sure. and then you wake up and you're this mountain of and it's like yeah. they were just they're just eat hiding and eating behind it and hiding, you know. Yeah. I, I didn't get to that point, but I definitely hid for some time. And I, I woke up, I'm like, how did I get underneath this rock? I'm like, I thought it was three days and it's like three years later. And yeah. it's like, whoa, I mean, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been under a freaking rock? And you're just like, how did I get under here? Yeah. I mean, we're human beings, right? We all have our ups yeah. and downs and we know our highest of our highs because we've understand the lowest of the lows. And we're at the yeah. lowest of the lows. We can uh, appreciate the joyous of the joyous moments because we know the sorrow. Mm hmm. Yeah, mine had to do with a poor business decision I made. Uh, but this was a long time ago, and I ended up working with really bad people. Uh, yeah, but it taught you. Uh, I'd say I, I was just kind of sitting there being irritated for about a month. And mm. then I built a plan to, uh, you know, what my next moves were going to be. Because that's all you can do. Yeah. And the behavior of these people was out of my control. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for sharing all that. And um, so optimizing nutrition, the body needs protein. Uh, let's talk about that. Your body needs high quality protein. There's no way around it. So I made a, I made a product called Fortigen. It helps vegans a lot who don't get high quality protein. And I'm sorry, I know Impossible Burger wants to tell you that pea protein is great. Uh, about 9% of it is used by the body. It also comes with an incredible just load of all sorts of other artificial chemicals and colors and, and things like that, which are toxic. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed an impossible burger to my enemy. You know, uh, I've only had it one time years ago um, in Studio City, California. I don't know, like our bodies are very intelligent. Like we know things. And and for me, like when I was a kid, I never watched the news. I just, I'm such an empath. I'm very sensitive. I never watched the news. It was just all chaos and junk. And something when this Impossible Burger came around, something told me no. And I was just always know about it. And I've heard for years, like how bad it is. And I'm like, oh, I'm not surprised. Like, it's not good for you. And you're explaining the reason why it's not good for you. I didn't know those things. I didn't, I didn't understand the concept of why. I just knew it wasn't. Right. So impossible burgers don't count for quality protein. They're garbage quality. Uh, and most vegetables don't really count at all either. Um, even steak is 38% usable by the body, eggs are 48%. But then the bacterial fermentation product uh, that I came out with, it's called Fortigen. That's almost 100% usable by the body. So almost no nitrogen waste is created. Uh, so like I take four doses of that a day. Here's how my day goes. And I, a lot of people really want to hear this because it's not like I'm acknowledging a particular way to eat is the right way. I'm just saying this is based on all my scientific analysis and everything I put together from the different concepts of fasting and uh, carnivore nutrition and, and um, dry fasting, like put, just putting that all together. And it's like, cause people email the company all the time. Like what does Dr. Jacobs do? Like, I want to know what he does. Cause he's obviously succeeding. And I think he's doing a little bit more than he's telling us. And it's not much more, but the way I execute it is probably a little more serious than others. So to get the longest fasted benefit, I want to do all my eating and hydration in a short window. Now, um, carbohydrates are, are not nutrition really at all and are not needed to sustain life. In fact, they're not even a macronutrient. I've proven that a couple of times uh, when looking at, like they're completely unnecessary for life. However, we like them because where they show up in nature is at the end of the hot season going into the cold season, where it is advantageous to be as fat as possible. That's why carbohydrates exist, to get us as fat as possible. Or uh, we can use them strategically to refuel glycogen in, uh, and, and you know, get energy back into the muscle. So like uh, Zach Bitter, he's a friend of mine. 
Uh, he holds is uh, a professional athlete. He's a world record holder in the hundred mile run. Wow! He's, yeah, <laughs> hundred mile. Hundred miles. I did twenty six point yeah. two in Alaska. I ran. I ran up Power Mount McKinley sidebar. I was a part of this company called Team and Train, and I raised forty five hundred dollars because I was Miss Michigan Teen one year, and um, you know, to do something to document uh, my leadership ability, I connected with Team and Train because my background is a runner, and I raised forty five hundred dollars, and I donate to kids with leukemia and lymphoma disease. And I went to Alaska and I ran a marathon, 26.2 miles, one time, one and done. I'm not a marathon runner, but yeah, wow. Uh, 100 miles is a lot. Whew. Well, he He's carnivore, but he takes in carbohydrates while he's on the run to convert it to energy to be used. So he is like fueling and burning, mm-hmm. like right at the same time. Yeah. So that means I use carbohydrates to replenish glycogen stores use like right after a workout. So, you know, like if I go into a workout dehydrated, which like before a photo shoot you would do, and uh, then you take carbohydrates and then begin to work out, like immediately all that glycogen gets pulled into muscle because there's so much signaling to use it. And then, so I can, I, I can hyperhydrate the muscle. Then I start drinking fluids, rehydrating the muscle with the fluid and with the glycogen, which is just sucking all that fluid up. And then I'll stretch. And that creates a, a, a condition called hyperplasia, mm-hmm. which is where the muscle cells actually split and become two cells. So that's why it's like carbs, liquid, workout, like all like beginning, you know, in like maybe let's say an hour and a half period where the, you know, the workout kind of happens at the end of the, end of that period. And then I go right into whatever my one meal a day is. So I try and do this like before dinner time. Mm. And then because I've had. So you don't uh, work out in the morning, you work out in the afternoon. I work out in the afternoon. Be right before you're going to eat your food. Yeah. Yeah. That way I get to really have the rest of the time dry fasted. So then I have a huge cup and, you know, I fill that with, um, with Fortigen. So I do four doses of Fortigen in here. And so I get 200 grams of my protein taken care of. And then for dinner, um, a little carbohydrate won't kill you at this point because you're, you're dry fasting, but you want to rehydrate while you're eating. So you actually need a little bit more carbohydrate. And remember, I developed this for the regular person to stick to Yes. Because because when I was just going like three days, no no food, no water, and just dropping pounds of body fat, yeah, that worked for me, but nobody else would do it. Yeah. You have the mental discipline, which is That's mind right. over matter. I have that too, being an right. athlete. Right. Yeah. Uh, and not everyone true. else can do it though, I guess. No, there's, totally. there's people who get like five hours into it and they're like, I just couldn't do it. Like They're emotional eaters. It's like, it shows you their strength of their mind actually <laughs> and their character. <laughs> One meal a day. They still get to eat. They still get to have some carbohydrates. So I'll do like a bacon cheeseburger for dinner, which Mm. most people can get on board with. So I'm actually not eating that much food um, and I'm rehydrating. So it's also high sodium food is good because I'm trying to get as much water in my system in that like four hour window. So it's really like a 20 hour dry fast and then four hours of eating and drinking so I can really rehydrate. Mm -hmm. The sodium, what kind of salt are you doing? Himalayan. Got it. Himalayan salt. Okay. Or, or just sea salt. It depends on, like, I travel a lot. I still travel a lot. I, I, I said I wasn't going to travel as much, but I'm still kind of am. I mean, uh, I have not been traveling at all. I've been totally laying low. Yeah. Well, you know, but I know a lot of people who are out there busy flying around. Yeah. Yeah. I used to fly 200,000 miles a year. That's not going to happen anymore. Yeah. 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 I mean, but those were like Greece trips, China trips, Russia. Yeah. I used to go to Russia a lot. Yeah. Oh, so the um the protein you were talking about, can I put the that in my smoothies? Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, don't then, put sugar in your smoothie. Just put no. that. Because oh, no. it has stevia in it, which makes it a little sweeter. Okay. So I don't have to put honey then. Nope. If it's already sweet. And then um cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some and I'm gonna try but it out. Portagen doesn't play well with other proteins. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I have um the one I have is a is a plant based chocolate one because I love chocolate. Okay. But I have this um pre-fiber thing. I can do the pre-fiber. I can do the collagen. Does it have collagen in it too or no? No, collagen will conflict with it. Collagen conflicts. Don't put the collagen yeah. in there either. No, 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 no. So what can you do it with macadamia milk, oat milk? Can you do it with uh like that? Or do you want to do it more with like a water? Water. Water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we could do another show on like nut milks. Yeah. I've never seen anybody milk a, an almond. 
Oh, I, I can't even have almonds because it makes me like bloated. You shouldn't eat nuts. No nuts. No nuts. No nuts. What about, no. oh, so no macadamia milk. Or oats. Oh, because oh, the, the volume that I was telling you about, um, it said stay away from um, oat milk. It said yeah. do, it said uh, do coconut. Yeah. Coconut's a seed. No, so no, coconut. No. So stay away from the, I, I well, oat milk's not mm. good, but so even, even the macadamia, I should stay away from that, huh? Yeah. I'm yeah. done. Yeah. I have, I have no, I have no nuts in my diet. I'm a, I'm I'm gonna be a Costco mom in the near future. Like I I get things like by, by a quarter. It's like if I get like toothpaste, I buy like three or four. So I just get it like once every three to four months. You know what I mean? So like my macadamia milk, I got like two cases of them from Costco. You have kids? Not yet. You just worry you're gonna run out of things. In the macro, it's like if if it's gonna preserve instead of me going like once a month to get something, I might as well just stock up for three to four months and do it in that kind of rotation. That's how I kind of work. God willing, I'll have kids. But when I was younger, I was I was always like, I'm gonna be a Costco mom because I loved having just a pantry full of like everything that you need. It's like I get excited like a kid in a candy store, you know, just being like stocked up on the good stuff. <laughs> I eat almost every meal at a restaurant. We have nothing in common. Uh, really? oh yeah. Yeah. I'm always out. You, how are you, you're going, oh, cause you're in California. People are going to the restaurants. No problem. Right. Oh no. I, just, out there oh, I, I know the restaurants that, um, you know, put Gavin Newsom on a dartboard and they just are hidden. But yeah. Yeah. Well, there. I'm not really talking about food anyway, like day-to-day food. I'm talking about more like toilet tree, deodorant thing. I'm a Costco mom in that yeah. way. I just order everything from Amazon because I don't want to, I don't want to take a trip to Costco. That's amazing. Oh, I don't either. They deliver it. I, I have the Instacart. Trust me. I am not an affiliate with Instacart, <laughs> but you know, in a rotation, I like it delivered. Me too. No way. But I love Amazon too. And we're not, I'm not an affiliate with Amazon either. Yes. Yeah. Coolio, coolio. So um, any other thoughts or anything you want to share? I think we covered a lot. That was great. Really? Really? Seriously? I am intrigued though. Um, like this is what I want to get into. Like what motivated you and excited you about, about science? I think it just always came easy. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, some things like some things people find very stressful. Others people feel like it's breathing. Yeah. When I had to find a research, when I do a research paper with references. Cool. Yeah. I know I'm better than everyone at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that was, that was pretty obvious. And it was just like science courses were just effortless to me. Love that. Oh my God. I, I love, I love uh, neuroscience. I love Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah. Um, I love Dr. Greg Braden. He's so cool. He, I was watching something with him and he was uh, sharing how what makes us different as a human species is just um, chromosome two and chromosome seven. C2 and C7 are, is, are the only reasons of how we um, are different than any other species living on the planet. I just thought that was so ooh, exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, so growing up, um, you know, as a youngster, was there um, a scientist or two that you really admired who was your mentor? Um, and then it's a two-part question. And then and then one that you actually got to meet in life? No. Really? Uh, no. No, I, I, I didn't think that probably like when I was a really little kid, I thought that um, Dr. Quest was cool, mm. but he's a cartoon character. You know, Johnny Quest, the TV show? I know the name, but... Okay. So his father was a scientist, and his father would apply science in a way where they were always in these crazy adventures where people were like, you know, doing like... Like, this is how Jurassic Park got its... Got the concept, got its start. Like, somebody would take the DNA of like, you know, a dinosaur bone and create dinosaurs to take over the world. And, you know, it was a corny TV show. But I was like, of all the like superheroes, like, Dr. Quest was the coolest because he actually understood how things worked. Like, I just, that's what I want. I want to understand how something works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, even now, like, somebody's, you know, the car breaks down and they can't diagnose what the problem is. And they'll, they'll tell me, like, oh, yeah, I just kind of, just kind of slow down and start to stop. And I'm like, well, did the lights dim while it was slowing down? And they're like, yeah, how did you know? Mm-hmm. That's an alternator problem. But they don't know that because they don't know anything works. So I just, I always wanted to be the guy who was able to understand what was really happening around me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, later on, I, I, I did have, um, I had a fifth grade teacher who I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. 
he had a PhD um, in in uh, in zoology, and so like he in his classroom, he got all kinds of special clearances. He had like rattlesnakes in his classroom, in cages, and it was just like, like why are you allowed to have that? And he was like, well, you know, here's like I know how to handle them. He was a just really really interesting guy, and uh, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from my father, who designed and built a lunar rover for NASA. He did, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. Well, I wasn't there. So there's not much I can say. That happened quite a bit before I was born. Um, oh, wow. So, you, yeah, that was it's, so NASA's in your family blood. Sure. Yeah, very cool. Very neat. Oh, my gosh. What a cool honor. Yeah, it was, a, it was a very interesting growing up with a person who solved problems for a living. Uh-huh. That's kind of what ultimately what I wanted to do. And, that's what I do. Yeah. Creating solutions for, um, you know, yeah. our health. Thank you so much. And, and, and for being you and doing the work that you're doing. And it's just, it's such an honor to connect with you. And it's been a really empowering conversation. And I know you've gifted a lot of value, um, to the viewer and the listener. And, um, you know, I value you and, you know, the most important thing is our time and our attention and sure. spending time with me right now. I'm just, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. It's such a, such a pleasure. And I'm going to have, um, everything in the show notes so you can uh, link below and uh, any last words of wisdom or any last uh, words you want to share before we sign off? You know, for the young people who are debating their career path or their education, I have three degrees. I don't particularly value any of them. So you learn, like, in, in fact, I, I pretty much went path of least resistance. Uh, like I went to Sacramento State uh, for undergrad that's like the number one university on Highway 50. It's also the only university on Highway 50, which is why I love saying that. Like, nobody cares. Like, if you achieve something, nobody cares where you went to school. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and so don't get distracted by shiny objects. Um, in fact, I, I met a CEO recently who said, I'd never hire anyone from an Ivy League school. And I said, why? I think I, I, I thought I knew why. And it turns out I was right. He says, because that's all they'll ever accomplish. Most of them. You know, it's like, oh, I went so and so place, and that they think they'll they'll be able to just say that wherever they go, and everybody will just think they're right. Well, the problem is in real life, whether you're right or wrong actually matters because you could bury a business or it can thrive. But just saying, you know, I went to such and such for school doesn't make a business successful. It doesn't do anything. All you get, all you get, is an attitude and a demand of overpayment, and yeah. then. Well, they, they get let go and then they go pull the same stunt at another company. Right. So the ego, the clout. Um... Right, right. And, and what, what people really want to know when they employ you or when you go off and do your own thing, let's say you have investors or you just need to buy in of your significant other as your, as your emotional support when you get something started, whatever it is, you got to be in a position, not where you have the education to do it because it doesn't mean anything. Because millions of others have that same education. What did they do? Nothing. So what you got to keep in mind is whatever you decide to do, that you're the world's expert on that. Now, if you want to develop the world's best toothbrush and you do a literature, literature review on teeth cleaning, different effective methods, and you really believe that you... Well, and here's where you have to be. You have to have absolute conviction that you're right. So like when some gym industry clown wants to argue with me, you know, and he's got all the accessories. He's got the sideways hat and a stainless steel ring on every finger. Um, so he's smart, obviously. And these guys, you know, they, they come at me and they have some sort of question. They really think they got me like, man, I've heard that question hundreds of times. Really? Mm -hmm. Here's the, you know, so like, and, and with OsteoStrong, like these gym people are like just self-propelled sandbags compared to the physicians I had to argue with to get, you can only imagine Changing the medical landscape is very difficult unless you have the proper documentation and evidence. And I do, and I have, which is why OsteoStrong is successful. Yeah. The reason why it's successful is, you know, and I, I put it all in, in the book, Weightlifting mm -hmm. is What You've Done. Like, here is the evidence that proves my statement. Now, if what I did didn't exist, would weightlifting be good? Sure, I guess. It would still be very inefficient, but now there's a better way. And if you care about... The practice of weightlifting and being as strong and as lean as possible, which are the two greatest drivers of long life, by the way, uh, you should care to read that because it will change the world. 
Beautiful. Thank you for sharing those wise words. I almost started crying. Like I was like getting ready for it. I'm like, I'm, I'm just being moved right now. I'm, I am, I'm so moved by hearing those words and especially, you know, for the youngsters hearing it, um, you know, it's a, it's insecurity, it's, it's money, it's ego, it's the clout, it's, you know, it's, it's the system, it's society of the projection of the illusion that you were saying earlier. It's the illusion. So just to, to hack all that, you know, from, oh, wow. I mean, thank you so much. And everything will be in the show notes, the book, check it out. And um, I'm definitely going to be calling Austria Strong immediately on behalf of my mother and getting her involved. So I'm going to take actionable steps on that for her and do the research and check it out. So if anyone, um, you know, if you're moved and inspired, please share this with a family, friend member, um, anyone you think that would benefit from this podcast, um, audio and video. And if you're on the audio, definitely go to the Sophisticated Psychos YouTube channel and check out the video because we are boss over here what's up <laughs> so what do you think about whey protein whey protein uh it's a uh, very low quality it does it only absorbs at a percent of uh, 18 i haven't done whey protein in like yeah. seven years i knew it i just wanted to hear it from you yeah it's i wouldn't if somebody gave it to me for free i would just buy it when i got home i'd just throw it away and then okay. what about hemp protein no no I mean, no no, I mean, is there's protein in hemp, but it's so unusable by the body. Like, got it. Yeah, awesome. hey, I understand. A lot of people would like to believe plants give us everything. They don't. Sorry, not even close. Yeah. Well, like if you see, actually see a vegan who has no processed food, they're probably emaciated, especially if they've been doing it more than six years. They're probably close to death of malnutrition. Oh no! Yeah. yeah you, do it. you you you're the body's not meant to do that. My sister was vegan for a while and now she's just turned into this carnivore. She's been doing this carnivore diet. She's been eating like beef liver or liver. I mean, she's been going like, she's been going straight. She was even doing ants. She was eating those ants. You know, you heard about that, but she was eating ants. You know what I'm talking about? The ants. I haven't done that, but she, that's what she did the ants, but in certain countries, that's, that's served. Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Cool. Well, maybe in the near future, we can have you back on. It would be an honor to honor you and add value and and share more of your stories because I'm sure you have so many of them. Okay, cool. Thank you, Dr. John. I appreciate you so much. Thanks, Katie. Okay, cool. Uh, We're signing out over here and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Kitty at Key, over and out.